C8 versus Attack on Titan, the final best of five series before we are heading into the grand final. So we're down to the last three teams. Team Beast Titan with Capybara and his boys is waiting in the grand final already and they are waiting for an opponent. And this best of five is going to determine which team they're going to go up against. So on the left in blue we have again Attack on Titan. So I mentioned it before, a lot of Attack on Titan fans apparently on the Korean side. And we have also C8. So time for more Korea, for a little bit more China influence here. 3,500 euros are on the line in this tournament. There are no draft rules, no shenanigans, just standard drafts, the normal stuff. And well, it should be an interesting series. And it feels like in the last couple of matches, Vala is a hero that not only has she made it through a few times, not that often, but again, she made it through. But she also is starting to fall off a bit in the ban pattern. You can see it here as well. So Vala does not get banned immediately, is now available for the picking. And C8 even hesitates for a second here. So it's kind of funny to me because when we went through the early games of the tournament, in the early matches, it was always the same pattern. Vala was just continuously banned, 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 banned. And then when finally you had a game where she wasn't insta-banned, she was picked within half a second. Now Brightwing gets the priority. Reset just loves playing Brightwing. He's been playing only support throughout the tournament. And to me personally, it's just really interesting that all of a sudden the teams are hesitating a bit more on how much they're valuing the hero. And this is them going more towards the European style of playing. In Europe, Vala just doesn't have the same priority that she has here over in the Asian server. And it's fairly interesting to see that now. To see how the top teams are adapting their pick and ban patterns slightly. And how Vala is falling a bit in priority. So... There's obviously a lot of preference picks that they're trying to deny to the opponent. I mean, at this point in time, there's just so many players on the other side that are really top-notch. But even Tigers has now higher priority than Vala all of a sudden. So yeah, Tigers gets picked again together with the Nuburag for KCB here. Yeah, it's an interesting one. Now, to be fair, Cursed Hollow is actually also a map that we haven't really seen all that much here in uh, the tournament just yet. But... I'm just personally pretty happy to see that now as the tournament continues, the meta is changing slightly and uh, they are doing some different things. We talked a lot about Anduin, the ultimate choice that we've seen there, that he doesn't get paired a lot with Genji and Light Bomb Engage, that ETC seems to have a much higher priority also in the meta. We've seen him multiple times, Vala of course, the given. And yeah, it's the, now things start to slowly change as we have the final two teams. And I would say these are the th big three. C8, Attack on Titan, and Team Beast Titan, definitely in the top three. We had some very close games between them. Not necessarily always when it came down to the score, but if you looked at the individual maps, then it was pretty clutch. Sergeant Hammer gets banned out, and well, here we go. Are we finally going to see a Vala pick? Because again... We are now down to the final picks, and she still hasn't been picked. Maybe they're ignoring her completely here. And also, what are they going to pair with Genji? Are we now all of a sudden seeing that Anduin combo, or do they opt for something else? There's ETC. Mention him a little bit before, and there's Anduin too. So this is starting to look a lot more and more like a European draft. <laughs> Dami on ETC. And yeah, ETC is still strange to me. I, wanna, I honestly wonder if like the Koreans just have unlocked that secret a little bit on how to get full value out of him once again. Whereas on the European side, ETC is very, very hit or miss. And I think to an extent this is also true here in uh, this tournament. But let's see what Dami can do with that now. And also what Anduin is going to pick. Because I have to assume at this point it is going to be the traditional light bomb combo with Genji for backline pressure. You rail together with a new Burak, so it's all back to uh, 2018, 19 Western Clash times that we had back then. And we get Mayev as the final pick. So very aggressive for what we are looking at from uh, C8 with Reset and his boys over here. Mayev, new Burak, Ural, good frontline, guarding Tigers. And the final pick, it is Greymane. Vala completely ignored. <laughs> Yeah, guys, Cursed Hollow is the map. Let's jump straight into it. It's a best of five series. First map between Attack on Titan and C8. 
Game number one. On the left in blue, attack on Titan. We have at the front line, Dami on ETC. At the Haga on the side lane. So this time the game damage output a little bit different. Greymane still a higher priority on the Korean side than what we see in Europe. We have Genji now together with Anduin. So personally, I'm hoping for the combo. Whereas on the right side of the map, it's C8 with reset again on Brightwing. We have that frontline combination of Anubarak and Ural that has been very popular in Korea even in the days of HGC. Then Maev and Tykes, with Tykes going into dash, which is pretty standard talent for the Korean teams to take with him. Now, a little bit of a slow start into this, as you can already tell. So we have Tykes up at the top. Nobody is going for that five-man middle play. Not against what's being run here by the blue team. And I am very excited for this. We've seen some great games from all these teams. Team Beast Titan waiting in the grand final. They've been able to go for a full winner bracket run. But this best of five series here is already going to set the pace a little bit. So, yeah. Grand final is going to be a best of seven, just in case that wasn't clear yet. Over here now, down at the bottom of the map. Yeah, it's Christmas already. Just look at that. So Mira has fully accepted that and is straight up on the gingerbread. Ooh, that's going to be uh, <laughs> it's going to be rough again. <laughs> Any plans for diets during Christmas are being heavily undermined by gingerbread. Absolutely love what you can get there. So, yeah, huge fan of that. Uh, but yeah, either way. Actually, you have to double check if it's already available in local supermarkets here. I don't think they have it yet, but I wouldn't be surprised. But we, we already have October. Like some of the supermarkets have already been starting to run Christmas stuff ever since September, but I don't think that gingerbread has popped up yet. But once it does, I will definitely have to be a bit careful again. Absolutely love that stuff, especially when it gets a bit colder outside. Right now, we still have beautiful weather here in, in Spain and Valencia. So, yeah. But yeah, a little bit sidetracked, but here he is. It's, it's, it's not my fault, it's this guy's fault. If you run around, you know, with full gingerbread setup, then at some point, yeah, I just have to comment on it. And good old Speculatius as well. Ah, oh, Christmas cookies, awesome stuff. Anyways, now that we're back with Heroes of the Storm, we got our level 4 talents in, and already it is Crowd Surfer. So this is... Crowd Surfer is just an awesome talent. You can make really cool plays with Crowd Surfer. Doesn't mean that the talent necessarily leads to them, but at least they are possible now. And we've seen that multiple times on other maps too, also whenever an objective is a bit more sheltered, ETC can really be the one that makes a surprise appearance and then just crushes opponents. For Tigers, we have again the extra attack speed, the passive with Master Assassin, particularly useful of course for Odin. Brightwing with a magic spit, just spitting around and up to the top we now have Genji, just trying to escort those Siege Giants a little bit deeper. Them taking them early. Siege Giants also at the bottom of the map, but maybe taking a bit too soon too, since C8 is now not going to be able to have them pushing for structures as everybody is fighting for the first tribute. Then again, they have Dehaka anyways at the bot lane, so both teams are technically running a global, even though Brightwing obviously has nowhere near the wave clear that we're seeing from Dehaka. KCB! Well, he is dead. So, he's down. KCB goes down, gets eliminated over here, and, well, that's bad news. So, a bit unfortunate for him. In that situation, he gets killed, and that means that they're also losing out right away at the Tribute. The first one, therefore, goes straight over to Attack on Titan. Decent start. First Tribute, first kill, a little bit of a leading experience. Nothing crazy. Here come the level 7 talents now for them. And with that, they have a tiny lead. Nothing that they can really use just yet, but of course, if they are able to pick up the second tribute, then they will be able to apply a lot of pressure on the third and maybe the fourth to get the first objective curse going and then push the opponent back even further. Leeching Scarabs after the initial start, still waiting to see what Tykes is now going to do. And we have him with the melting point. So, still going for a bit of grenade pressure. But also at the same time, in the middle of the map, they're attacking again, trying for another kill. KCB gets dragged, but still fine. And no big kills here yet either. It's a bit of a slower start in the game. Nobody's going for these big all-out commitments to fights. But now, with this tribute spawning on the left side, it's a very uncomfortable situation for C8. They don't really want to fight into this. The position actually favors attack on Titan. It's heavily leaning towards their side of the map. 
and towards their mid lane fort. So it makes it a bit awkward since the blue team really, really would love to pick this one up and get that 2-0 lead so that they can threaten the first curse. And for the red team poking into this, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be highly uncomfortable. The Haka is pushing the top lane in the meantime, and the more time they can buy down here, the better it will be for Team Attack on Titan. The Haka coming in right now. They got them stunned out over here in the middle of the bush. And everybody has to retreat again. Tiny lead and experience still maintained for Attack on Titan. But yes, very uncomfortable spot for C8. And they are starting to fall back here. They will still interrupt for a long time. That's to be expected at least. So yeah, interrupt is coming. Starts with another channel potentially. And Anubra gets caught and killed again. Second kill against the Cockroach. And that is the second tribute channeled by Attack on Titan. This is really bad now for CA. This is really bad. They're behind in experience. They're really struggling. They will be... I mean, honestly, they will most likely face a curse considering how this is going. The experience lead is fairly solid. Level 10 is now going to kick in for Attack on Titan. And the second that they have level 10, they should be able to pick up that tribute and then really run with a curse. Now the red team is doing the only thing that they pretty much can do. They're going for their own boss up at the top. They're not nearly as fast as what we're seeing from their opponents, but they should still be able to lock this one in in time. ETC coming through with a stage dive. And we also have, finally, thank god, the Light Bomb together with Genji. Too many times have we now seen Genji played with Anduin and then Anduin just going for the bubble. But now we have the engage into the backline. And that should make things very interesting. Particularly since it's, of course, directly threatening those backliners on the side of C8. The good news for C8 is that they actually have level 10 by the time that the tribute spawns. And this time the spawn position is favoring them. So heavily leaning towards the right side of the map. And that essentially means that there's even a chance that Attack on Titan just lets this one go. And doesn't even uh, necessarily fight for it. Bottom fort has now been destroyed. And it seems like the boss is even going to do some damage to the keep wall. But up at the top, ETC is still defending. So technically, we now have two globals against the red team. ETC diving in as we speak. Comes through with a slide right afterwards. And there's the drag. But they won't be able to get the kill yet. Irel didn't even have to use her ult either. But yes, top lane has been defended down at the bottom of the map. Bit of damage has been done. I guess one of the towers is now going to fall. Tribute, on the other hand, hasn't been picked up yet. So, yeah, they start, or they keep interrupting it. And if they buy time here, that will favor their top lane, where we still have Siege Giants. So this entire wall could be destroyed, particularly if the Harker is now coming in and tries to take this entire minion wave out. So time is working in their favor there. But the Tribute has now finally been channeled, so C8 has won and can now defend here. So might be able to save the entire wall, but it's also time that they have to spend defending top when as the next push is already down here in the mid lane. Generally speaking, Attack on Titan has a bit of a lead. Two kills to zero, two tributes to one, bit ahead in experience, has taken a fort down, so passive experience is now also going to increase from here on out. But how exactly is C8 now reacting? We haven't really seen a big team fight after level 10, but now we see a bigger one. Skirmishes have happened before, but here comes the next kill, I suppose, because Tychus is in real trouble. Slides out with the dash, and even Brightwing is able to escape. So all of a sudden, it might be the blue team that's in trouble. Anduin with a pull, but they have to try and save him. The Haka is coming in to make this a 5 versus 3, 5 versus 4, and they are able to disengage after that. So that was well defended initially by the red team and they nearly were able to turn it on to their opponents and get a kill themselves. But saving Brightwing and Tychus was absolutely crucial in that situation. This could have backfired heavily, particularly now that we have another tribute spawning on the map. Lead in experience, lead in talents, advantage goes to Attack on Titan. The blue team in game number one of this best of five series is doing solid work here. And if they get that tribute, this could hurt. And again, don't fuck. Oh, they catch Brightwing. Now ETC sliding in after the isolation on Maev. She's trying to jump out. 
Maev able to escape, and there it is. Genji with a light bomb engage stuns her out. Maev is gone. It's a double kill for Attack on Titan. C8 still waiting for their first kill, but now they are cursed too. So not only are they missing out on two heroes for defense, at least for now, but they are also cursed and starting to lose more structures. Particularly the top lane, Ford won't stand a chance. Over here, ETC is just proxying away for at least could. Comes in. Can easily slide out, of course. Has picked up on level 4, as we talked about earlier, the crowd surfer. And now they're breaking through structures. Down at the bottom of the map, that's the only lane that's more or less safe because of the siege giants that got picked up by C8 earlier. So at least those boys are doing some work. Everybody is just asleep on the job. But the siege giants, they're still pulling through. These bad boys need a race, or at least they would have needed a race, but they got killed already. So two forts gone with the curse. And Genji is jumping down to the bot lane to open this up and maybe even take another tower down. So that's the next one. Sitting here in the middle, we got the Haka doing his thing. Two level lead right now for Team Beast. Uh, sorry, Attack on Titan. <laughs> Beast Titan is not here yet. There's so many Titans here, honestly. I mean, I appreciate the, the anime fans here, but they could have gone for some different names. I mean, one team could have called themselves Team Demon Slayer or whatnot. Um, or given that we had the live action come out recently, Team One Piece. If you haven't watched that, by the way, make sure that you check out the One Piece live action. It is way better than it has any right to be. I was never a massive One Piece fan, but I gotta say that the live action is a very cool adaptation. It's really, really well done, and they're trying to stick as close as possible to the source material, so I thoroughly enjoyed it, and it's probably one of, if not the best, anime life adaptation that I've seen so far. So if you haven't watched it yet, can heavily recommend it. But yeah, either way, uh, with that we now have over here another boss about to be attacked and I think the red team should really rethink this if they are currently debating whether or not they should attack because they are down two levels and level 16. Not something that you want to go for here. So yeah, there we go. ETC takes it. <laughs> it can still stand out, but in this case, I guess we're going to let it slide. They take the boss and the Haka has actually safeguarded the top boss too. So they can now try and make a play for a double and get that one done. Get two bosses, push the bot lane, push the uh, top lane and just apply general pressure. Pin down C8. And C8 needs a breakout play. They haven't gotten a single kill yet in this game. When we're looking at the damage output, you can also see that this was not the most aggressive game so far. There were a lot of situations where one of the teams just had to fall back. Mainly, of course, the team in red. But now it's 15,000 damage for Maiev as top damage, 19,000 for Genji. So not really the most explosive start into this. Everybody is just playing it very, very strategic and tactical. Trying to just slow things down a little bit. Not take any fights that they are going to regret later. No Nobody's YOLOing this out. As a fair chunk of prize money on the line. And you want to make it into the grand final and face off against the final boss. So in order to do that, they need to take fights that are smart. And this limits their options a bit. But now that we are about to hit level 16 for the red team, this is the chance to really bring it back now. Epicenter is in on level 16 for Nubarak. We got the spray and pray and armor piercing rounds again for Tigers as per usual agreement. And Urel going into the Templar's verdict. Then again, Anubarak, does he get killed? The stun with the life bomb catches Brightwing. Both of them are low and both of them make it out. Didn't see an X strike there, but yep, that was clutch. And now the fight turns. Disc is missing. They're still trying to go for the Haka. It could be the first kill for CA. They're desperately trying, but thus far they haven't gotten a hold of anybody. At least not properly. Genji jumping in, out. The curse of the tribute is still on the ground. Top keeper's taken damage, but hasn't fallen. And they grab another tribute. So C8 is finally able to get themselves into a position where they could technically curse Attack on Titan by grabbing another tribute later on. So good for them, but it worries me a bit that they're up against two globals. Brightwing just can't hold the candle to uh, what they have. ETC has more wave clear here, the Haka of course too. So when the two of them uh, just control the side lanes, then it's gonna be uh, it's gonna get really really tricky. But yeah, we'll see. 
Up at the top, Urel is currently trying to hold the lane. This is obviously the most important one to them right now, since the keep there has already taken damage. They're going for a kill on ETC. I'm not quite sure if the rest can, uh, can get here in time. ETC is low. Light bomb. Nice done. X-Strike. They save ETC. And instead, it is the Fruit Fly that might be in trouble. ETC jumping out barely as they caught a noob rock already and dropped him. And now it's the uh, Fruit Fly that dies. Trash Wing is dead. Reset has been eliminated. Six kills to zero. And this is big. Those are two super important kills. And they come at the perfect moment in time. ETC was able to pick up a tribute for free. They have already a camp at the top lane that is pushing. We see them grabbing another camp. They're close to 20, one and a half minutes on those bosses. So they're not even going to go for those. It's going to be straight up keeps that they're aiming for. And they're going to get two, at least. Two at least. Unleashed is in. Anduin with the Varian's legacy. There's the kill. The keep is gone. And I expected them to rotate much faster towards the top lane to drop this one as well. But they didn't. And therefore, only one keep down thus far. But they have a couple of camps that they can claim. Could then use a push through the top lane to drop another keep. That's two level of elite that they currently have there. Very decisive moves also being made. And I have to admit that it's a bit unfortunate for CA that a lot of these attacks that they're trying to run just don't work out properly. They got the disc or the cocoon disc on ETC. Really did a great job there isolating him. And then they just fail to get the kill and the fight turns against them. I mean, they're really trying. <laughs> they're really trying to get these kills. <laughs> and uh, it's just, yeah, unfortunate. Imagine a kill coming in. Then the tribute would have probably been theirs, and that's the ticket back into the game. They also were attempting to force a fight before level 20 talents were available for Attack on Titan. So you can't really blame them for any of the decisions that they've been making at that point in time. And there were some good decisions too, but yeah, not too much that they were able to pull off. Up at the top, Reset is getting attacked, but is able to get out, so neither Dehaka nor Genji could really stop him. And now that Urel is moving in... Uh, let's see. Okay, so they're not forcing this. For a moment I was thinking, is she really trying to engage and make a play? The surprising part, if anything, is that Attack on Titan has not capitalized more on the level 20 advantage. They're now trying to use it to uh, get themselves a boss. And I suppose they could also try to get two, considering that it should be timed quite nicely. There are two tributes to each team's name, which means that the next team to take a tribute is going to set a curse up. Red team, they don't have level 20. They're really trying to fight this. They know this boss will go for core. So they're trying to come in here. And Nubra diving out and still alive. They're pulling everything. They might steal this one. They might actually be able to steal it. ETC had to jump out level 20 or not level 20. C8, they don't give a shit. No, they take it. They come in and they're trying to grab this boss away. And do it and Nubra both that the red team claims the boss. They drop Raymane, ha 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 ha, what a slaughter now all of a sudden. They steal the boss, they finally get a couple of kills. Hell, it's about time. They haven't gotten a kill all game and now they got three. They are hoping for more even. Up at the top, Mayev trying to go for Curse. They are also attempting, of course, to save the keep. That might not be possible for them, but they have level 20 and they are starting the comeback. Look at that fight. I mean, just check this out. This was actually so well done by them. I can't believe that survived all through all of it. That was so clutch. They got the curse against the opponent. They got the boss. They would have lost the game right there if that fight went against them. They were forced into it. They didn't have level 20 yet. They decided to go for it. It was too dangerous to let that boss go for core. And they are able to play it out. Eight kills to three. Four at the bot lane is gone. They saved their keep at the top. Genji will probably take it out eventually, or one of the globals. But still, for the time being, they still have access to it. Yeah, now it's a fight all of a sudden, isn't it? Because the forts are all going to be destroyed. This one at the top is not going to make it either. There's a boss that can be claimed, and that's exactly where they're going now. So they are hoping that they can make some big plays towards the top lane. And there is a chance. I mean, they're very, very close now in structures. 
keep here again insanely low so i suppose it's going to be picked up eventually but at least for the time being c8 has brought themselves back into this game and is starting a bit of an ign 6.5 out of 10 moment so yeah this is gonna be more than a bit interesting can they turn this can they actually bring this back now i mean this is the opportunity right here if you go through the top, you get a kill, you go for a keep, then at least you can drop that. If you get more than a kill, then you might even be able to go for the core instead. We're 19 minutes in, so meaning the boss is fairly strong. It's not slapping everything, but they also have the big red button and they're not afraid to use it. Already popping it right there. Big red button is in the house and off we go. The attack is coming and boy is the blue team all of a sudden struggling. They dominated the entire game, the entire game, up to the fight at the boss. And even there, they had many advantages that they were just not able to use properly. Now their top keep is getting destroyed, and this is getting insanely dangerous. C8, they've been slapped around the entire game. They always believed in the comeback, and they're about to pull it off. The Haka is low, ETC jumping in, and Anduin is dead again. Anduin gone, double kill against the red team though, but the core is getting attacked. They need to take the damage dealers out and the boss quickly. 50%, 40%, is the defense gonna make this happen? It's so close, but they're not gonna be able to take the core down. Mayev is about to die. 17% 15 <laughs> they can't end the game oh, no Urel is dead too five man team wipe everybody dead the Hark are already over here on the right side they are trying to end the game now crossing the map without Anduin holy shit Guys, they're not able to pull it off. C8 with such a close call there. They were so close to winning the game, to turning it around. But now instead what we're seeing is a quick attack against the core. Nubarak back in 10 seconds. So is Brightwing. It's not gonna be enough. They need more than that. This is brutal. The core goes down. Unfortunate for C8. Attack on Titan with the lead in the best of five series here in the Healing League. GG. Before we head into game number two, make sure that you subscribe to the channel if you haven't done it yet so you don't miss out on any future content here on Caldo TV. Battlefield of Eternity, here we go, map number two, C8, nearly with a comeback. Honestly, it was pretty impressive. The entire game, they were struggling, and then towards the end, they had this one fight they won, gained so much momentum, and they got the core down to 15%. It would have been pretty funny if they won the game right there. It would have been cool. But obviously, Attack on Titan, they threw everything they had against them and were able to take him out on the core. The entire team, full five-man wipe before anything else happened and the game was decided and just crossed the map and took it themselves. Now we have Vala banned out immediately again. So, uh, yeah, in Battlefield of Eternity, they still don't want to go up against them. And it's, yeah... It's cool to see Valaban again. On Curse, they didn't feel the need. Nobody really respected her here. But on Battlefield of Eternity, with all of the team fights and her opportunities to just stack her level 1, nobody wants to risk it. Yeah, and Sylvana's also obviously banned out very, very quickly here. So that she can't push together with the Immortal. I should also note that the ban on Lucio is not all that common. I highlighted that a bit when we were talking about other uh, events here and about other matches on the Korean server that Lucio, generally speaking, is being led through the draft of the first few bans a lot more than what we would experience normally in uh, the European scene but yeah well one thing that i also want to point out because the topic comes up again with the korean meta like how does it measure up against the european meta what is stronger keep in mind that we had multiple offline events recently with international uh, participation so first of all we had the nations cup in berlin where we had korean teams present and we also had at the end of last year the heroes international in miami where we also had korean teams now if you've missed any of these games and you want to check them out there are playlists on the YouTube channel that you can have a look at. Now, first and foremost, if you haven't watched the Heroes International yet, uh, you should. That took place last year. But even bigger than that was the Nations Cup that we had in Berlin. I mean, that was 
amazing we had multiple casters there teams from all over the world we had at the same time also of course a huge audience there too so if you really want to experience some offline events within heroes of the storm in 2023 2022 those are the events you should look for for the playlists on the channel and it also kind of shows you a little bit how the metas currently are matching up between the regions north america korea and also europe so if you haven't seen these games these matches, these tournaments, make sure that you check them out. Playlists are on the YouTube channel. We have again Genji and Anduin. And I get the feeling, honestly, that more and more the teams are now really willing to adopt, or to take this, I don't want to say take this more serious, but really go a little bit deeper there. So now after we've seen on the previous game already Genji plus Anduin with Light Bomb Engage, now it, things, it seems like we're going to get the same thing here just from uh, the other team. C8 coming in and uh, doing that. So, yeah, uh, we get Diablo and we get Brightwing on the other side. And with Hammer Band, with Hanzo Band. Particularly Hanzo, of course, another big damage dealer against the Immortal. What are they grabbing? Is it a Li Ming? Is somebody popping up Lunara again? She had a few games that she was played out. There's, of course, a few other heroes that you can also take for damage against the Immortal. And let's not forget, Koreans still like Tychus here. So even here, they usually like to play Tychus, but it's Jimmy instead. We still get a bit of a StarCraft action, but it is Reyna. All right. So I guess Exterminator. We had one game this tournament where Jimmy was picked in Battlefield of Eternity and they were an ace in the hole. Personally, I think that was a misclick. After that, I think he was played... One more time, two more times, and then, of course, with Exterminator, so they can get in the extra damage against the Immortal. But yeah. Final bigs, there's Tychus, already called him a second ago. So now Tychus is in the house, Suns out, Guns out, we get Garrosh as the front line for C8 as they're trying to turn it, and Medivh as the final pick. Good stuff, Battlefield of Eternity, the 1-0 lead in the best of five series for Attack on Titan, and we're heading straight for the second map, Battlefield of Eternity. Attack on Titan has the lead, and they got Jimmy, not only him. We have Medivh, which is actually pretty cool. I believe this is one of our first Medivh plays in the tournament. And on level 1, as expected, Exterminator, you get all that damage in on the Immortal. Now Diablo at the front, played by Dami. We have also Urel together with him, so a very heavy front line for them. And they pick Brightwing away, so that reset now is playing Anduin instead for C8. We got Garrosh and Mal on their end and for extra damage it is Tychus plus Genji and of course the combo is really nice here as well because you have again the option to go for a swift strike engage into the back line with a light bomb on you and then just stun them out so it's pretty much what they're going to uh, try and do here but my eyes are on Medivh because first and foremost stacking on the baseline is going to be pretty important to see how much of an impact he's going to have in the later stages of the game but he's also the one that can make a lot of strong plays happen. Now, of course, if you go up against Garrosh and you have Mediv, that instantly means that whoever gets flipped could be saved. You have your shield, you have the portal, you can safeguard people easily, but you can also allow heroes like Diablo to be a lot more aggressive than they normally would be. And Diablo is already the OG bully that just likes to be in your face, steal your lunch money and just beat you around and stuck you in a uh, locker a little bit. So if you have Mediv to help him out, then uh, that's even better. Mediv is pretty much a lookout. He just makes sure that everything goes well. So a couple of stacks already in for Mediv, talking about him. Now he gets caught, has the portal, and gets out. <laughs> that would be a very early and very annoying kill against him if he died here already and lost his stacks. I mean, it's not too much, but the nine that you have, you still want to keep them. By now, the camp gets stolen. So, still aggressive performance from C8 as they're moving in again. And let's see what else they can do here. They gotta fight back. You don't wanna fall 0-2 behind in the best of 5 series that early. Gotta play around a little bit and uh, show what you're up to. At the top, we still have Marthel going up against Urel. So the one-on-one -on -one lane has been established. And now Genji is helping out a bit. He's trying to ensure that they're getting a second camp as well. So he's going to be the one putting pressure onto Urel. Whereas Marthel is starting for the camp. Anduin is now moving over to 
And, well, the blue team not lazy on that rotation either. It's a full five versus five as the two teams are going for it. Seems like the blue team might be able to uh, lock this one in. They get it. Do they get some kills as well? Seems like it. But first, they're losing Jimmy. Jimmy gone. And here comes Yorel. What? No kill against Tykes? No way. They all get out. <laughs> Nicely done. So, the camp... Gets taken, Jimmy falls. With Jimmy, if Jimmy doesn't die, I think they get three kills. If Jimmy doesn't die and they have an additional range damage dealer in the outcome of the fight, he would have taken down three heroes, I suppose. That would have been something. But again, as it played out, the camp got stolen, immediately defeated against. Only one kill so far in the game in favor of the red team. Teams are now picking up their level 4 talents. And it is Immortal time. Immortal number 1 is ready. And who takes the lead? Jimmy should be the one. Oh... Yeah, has to be saved by Medivh there. He got in an awkward spot because he was trying to dodge the Immortal stun. Had not really a lot of ways to go and then moved straight into the opponent's team who welcomed him with open arms, of course. Medivh saving the day there for them. And while they are defending, Jimmy is trying to catch up. Will catch up a bit, but is not able to get them the halftime show advantage. That goes to C8. So, can they take the entire thing? Mediv also with 27 stacks now, so he is pretty diligent about that and is so far doing a good job on it. He's trying to get a bit more done here. Everybody's just stacking up, so it's a target-rich environment. But it seems that the first objective is going to be claimed by the red team. Jimmy alone, he is great in that situation. He is fantastic on the Immortal, but he's not good enough to make up for that difference that was already established earlier by C8. So, for now, we have the first Immortal push, roughly 30% on the shield. Medivh is sitting at 31 stacks, so if he plays this out properly during this push, he should be able to complete his quest. Yeah, sitting at 32, throwing a few more out, just dodge the stuns, make sure that you're not getting too close to uh, Garrosh, and you should be fine. Question is more so how much damage does C8 now do? They have level 7 as an advantage. 35 stacks for Medivh. This is where you hold your shield back. This is where you're just using it for yourself. Where you're like, nope, I'm a bit stingy on that, sorry. If you want a shield, that's the wrong uh, that's the wrong moment. I'm not Oprah, baby. Not everybody gets a shield. I make the choices here. Anduin gets killed as they're diving in deep. Okay, so they take the support out. We're hoping for an additional kill that they haven't gotten thus far. The defense on the Immortal going well for them. Taking the Immortal down, not losing the fort, getting a kill in the process. And I guess the only, not really setback, but the only sad thing for Medivh at least is that he still hasn't completed his his quest. Is sitting at 38 on the other hand, so I mean he should be fine. There's nothing honestly that he, yeah, that's going to be a problem for him. Unless he really runs it down, he is going to be done with the quest in a moment. One hit is all that he needs. And up at the top, the fight is now breaking out once again. Urel just hoppity hop, the space goat hopping in hoops first until she's blue in the face. And they are fighting with all five. Medivh completing the quest and now getting the cooldown reduction. They steal the camp, or not steal, but they take the camp again. Blue team therefore doing a fairly solid job on mercenary camps now. And it also shows in the lead that they have in experience. So, right now, they are ahead by nearly half a level. If they can maintain that and maybe even build on it. It would be pretty sweet towards the next Immortal phase when they're grabbing the early level 10. Diablo is also now fully stacked, so it's not only Medivh that was doing a good job on that. And they're opening the wall up too. So, this is a fairly aggressive push from them. Fairly decent one. And now with Malthel still down at the bottom of the map, they're trying for Tychus. They get him, and then Garrosh saves him. Garrosh saves the day for Tychus. Jimmy is not out of harm's way yet, and Malthel is coming in from below. Has to be a bit careful, though, because he's the only one on that side of the portal. So, yes, the Immortal is back up, still nobody dying, and now Jimmy is in position right at the beginning of the Immortal phase. Way better for him now. And he's immediately starting to chunk this down. But that fight is not over yet either. Genji moving in, has to jump back out. Malthel is now also doing immortal damage, so he's on the objective. Everybody is just fighting this out. Like, all-out war now. 
all out battle. Five versus five. Garrosh low about to get away here. Diablo closes the gap, takes him on, but Jimmy has died too. Second time that Jimmy falls. Reset on the run. Anduin is dead, and that's two heroes on the side of C8 that now were evaporated. We have level 10 in, and that means Polybomb for Medivh, together with the Lightning Breath. So no Leyline, no Leyline Apocalypse either, nope. But that was level 10 ability is, of course, a huge deterrent when it came to C8, so they had to move back after these kills too. We now have Torment and Souls again, which is actually the priority pick, as it seems, on uh, the Korean side. We have seen very few... Have we seen any last rides? Now that I think about it, have we seen any last rides? I'm actually not sure. Down on uh, the bottom of the map, we have in the meantime oh, the first fort destroyed. So yes, this one has been taken out. With Tiger starting to do damage over on the right side. The red team has decided to fully defend with everybody else. But the continuous poke from a distance should eventually lead to an immortal victory for Attack on Titan. At least that's what it seems like. But either way... Jumps are coming back in. Yeah, there's the stun attempt. No, they're going for KCB once more. Poli is already out. Everybody dropping a bit low here, particularly Garrosh, but Urel is also starting to be in trouble and pops the ult in literally the last moment. I mean, holy hell. That was clutch. They win the Immortal and then save everybody on the team. Three kills to two. And good job by Attack on Titans. And now an opportunity to push back the bot lane. And since they opened up the wall earlier, they now have a chance to maybe take that fort out as well and equalize the position regarding structures. But Odin gets popped right away. So they got Odin out now. Try and take uh, the Immortal out as best as they can, as quickly as they can. With Urel now moving in down from the bottom of the map, there might still be some damage. But look at Jimmy. He's dead again. Genji came in, Swift strikes straight to the heart and takes him out. And that is one of the big problems. If you're playing uh, Jim Rayner, you just do not have the mobility to dodge out on these. <laughs> oh, that hurts. <laughs> That's just annoying. That's really annoying. Down at the bottom of the map, in the meantime, they're trying to do some damage here too, but the rotation has happened. So C8 is defending. And I have to admit, I really like this series. Game number one, the back and forth on Cursed Hollow was just glorious, particularly the ending of the game. And now C8 just seems, I don't want to say like a different team, but they have definitely found their rhythm compared to the early and mid game on Cursed Hollow. Now, right from the start, we see them with a lot more aggression. The coordination is better. They're getting their kills. So they've really found their, their flow. Jimmy has died three times. He's the only one dying so far on the blue team side. If anything, Medivh needs to probably pay a bit more attention to him. When he gets jumped by Genji in particular, things are getting uh, tricky. The light bomb engage from uh, Anduin Genji is still taking victims. And here comes again, a level 13. So now that gives us give me more. And on level 7 we had the fuel rush. So a little bit of a different talent compared to the usual auto attack choice. They still want that fort. <laughs> they still want to make sure that they're drawing even in structures. That they get the passive experience as well, of course. So, yeah, that's that. But... Yeah, they're getting close on this. Just a couple of hits and you have that thing. It doesn't seem like it can get close enough. Nah, defense is still a bit too vigilant. Now, Medivh has sniffed all of that out. Needs to portal out. Still got the portal available here, but they're not making a play for the camp. Over on the left side, by the way, this one has been taken by Dami earlier. So they have one and a half minutes where they cannot rely on that camp at all. Which is a bit annoying, because that means from their perspective that there's only one team that currently has a uh, Shaman camp. And that's their opponent. And that will not only safeguard the fort at the top, but also do a lot of work there. Great barbecue play by Diablo. Zoning everybody out, doing a lot of damage here. And resulting in C8 retreating. So Diablo now with 18,000 damage. That was a really nice choke point play that he could make. Uh, they are trying to win the day. Jimmy again making his moves. Medivh is dead. They were able to take him on. So with Medivh dying, that's a 5 versus 4. C8 is really, really showing them how it's done now. They are starting to get ahead here. Not only do they win the halftime show again, but they are now also about to claim a small lead in experience. They have the lead in kills. And even with Bright being likely taking out the top four, that's a huge advantage now for the red team. 
They want to bring this one back. So over here, they try and make another play for Jimmy, and you guessed it already. He's dead again. Fourth time now. The fourth time that Jimmy is gone. Diablo and the rest of the team trying to save him, and that could be their downfall. Diablo gets attacked. Medif is back and can provide a portal to help him get out. Brightwing has been able to push the top lane out and take the fort on, but that also means that now the immortal is taken. And this is looking better and better for C8. C8 is now in a very, very good position. Not massively ahead or anything, but they can now likely take out a second fort. They should be able to do that. And yeah, we'll see how much is possible for them at this point. So what can they do here? For the time being, what we have is Tigers leading the charge, or sorry, Malthe leading the charge with 38,000 damage, 35,000 for Tigers. And there, yeah, in comes the play up at the top, as they are again going for Medivh, halfway down in HP already. And look at Genji just in that backline immediately, not even with Light Bomb. Light Bomb is now in and it gets used to stun out too, as they were trying to make a play for Garrosh. Diablo falls, Malthael with the Tormented Souls again. They're controlling the choke point, the fort is already gone, they have level 16 talents at this point in time. Odin gets popped and they're not even happy with just getting the fort here, they want to do more, they want to drop that wall, they want to get damage onto the keep itself. I don't think they can take it out. But they will do damage here. They have done damage. Opening the wall up alone is already big. And instantly, whenever that portal happens, everybody is trying to make sure that whoever comes through, if anybody comes through, is going to be in a bit of trouble. So 16 versus 16. But structures are now falling quickly on the side of Attack on Titan. Rallying cry for Jimmy on level 16. So uh, yeah, no paint and red or uh, anything. We get the full Firestorm build again for Diablo. Tigers has gone for the sizzling attacks on uh, level 16 here. And yeah, the double pull of course from Anduin. Duh! What else are you gonna take? That talent is still absolutely bonkers. But at this point, what we have is 30,000 damage for Medivh. He's top damage in the game now. Diablo is a close second with 28,000. But the two of them can absolutely not hold a candle to what's being done on the damage department from uh, Tychus and from Mouth Ale. So those two are definitely running the show here. Six kills to three. Initially things started off well for Attack on Titan, but currently they are struggling. Can they somehow turn this? Yorel was already sitting at the side looking for a flank opportunity that never really came for her. So she rejoined with the rest of the team. And here comes another Immortal. This is going to be on even talents right from the beginning. And the question is then simply, what exactly can they do with this objective? Finally, they have also a Shaman Camp at the same time. And honestly, that Shaman Camp might be able to do some serious damage now at the bottom of the map. And maybe even drop that fort, depending on uh, whether or not the red team is sending somebody to uh, defend. But the Immortal is a real story. You need to win this one. If they win a fight now, Attack on Titan, and they win the Immortal, then they can definitely bring this one back and would likely take the lead. But at this point in time, C8 is the one making the bigger plays. But then again, they are a bit late to the party here on the Immortal, aren't they? So are they giving up the halftime show? They have good damage too. They're not trying to defend. Instead, they're just trying to attack as well and get Malthael on the point. Bottom of the map still has to be defended. Diablo coming in. Maltael dipples with a fire breath, a lightning breath, trying to burn them down. But he still cannot get that kill on Garrosh. He's so close sometimes, but he can't get the kill. They're chasing them, and they're chasing them hard. And Garrosh gets saved. Oh, but Anduin dies, and so does Garrosh. Anduin and Garrosh, they both fall, and that's a five versus three. Somebody has to defend the keep at the top, though. Somebody has to defend that keep. That needs to be done. If they don't defend that keep, then it's gone. And they are sending Brightwing back. What the hell is the Fruit Fly gonna do? Trashwing has no chance here. They sacrificed their keep. They only took the halftime show and they sacrificed a keep. Guys, whatever you're smoking, smoke less. Like, what the hell? That was not worth it. Even if you take that Immortal with 100% shield, which you're not able to do, you're not going to be able to end the game here. You're not even going to be able to get a keep, in my opinion. Huge problem. 
On the decision making, I cannot agree with this at all. Maybe sending Urel back would have had an impact there. But Brightwing? Brightwing is not going to do anything. So they won the fight, they lost the keep, and they won the Immortal. Now, the big question is, what can they do with it? What can they actually claim? Getting the fourth destroyed is a given. But considering that they just sacrificed their top lane keep, they should try and do more than that. And it's not going to be easy. So right now we have C8 doing the best they can to poke the Immortal low before it even reaches the keep wall. And they already have the shield removed. So unless there's a few kills incoming, there's not going to be a lot that Attack on Titan gets here. Brightwing has so far not joined, still pushing out the top lane. Not necessarily needed just yet. Marthael zoning them a little bit further. Brightwing moves down to the bottom of the map immediately as this happens, but they created space to defend against the Immortal, and they do. So all of this plays out before the blue team gets level 20, which was one of the reasons why Brightwing was for so long at the top lane in the first place, trying to get the Storm Talent for the team. But still, was that really worth it? Did Attack on Titan really gain anything here? They lost the keep and they killed or destroyed a fort. Yeah, they got a half level lead that allows them to get level 20 early, but what are you going to do with that? Nothing. They're not doing anything with that. So, I honestly don't think that this was worth it. Losing that keep, not really. You needed to win the Immortal, but after they had the two heroes killed, somebody should have moved back immediately. Okay. Doesn't mean that they're losing the game. They still have, of course, a chance here. If they are able to win another Immortal, the next one's going to be big, then this changes everything. Medivh is still cheating and provides vision everywhere. We have the Arcane Brilliance right now. Uh, this is level 20 talent. Jimmy upgraded the, uh, Rainers, uh, the Raiders and is now on uh, Duskwing. And here comes the big red button. No one can stop death. X-Strike cooldown reduction and the sensor for Anduin. So yeah, here we go. Camps are up again. In addition to that, we have the Immortal announced. Moment of truth. 2-0 or 1-1. What's it going to be? If you win the team fight right now and you take a decent Immortal, the game should be yours. Jimmy has died four times. Anduin has died three times. Yeah, camp is taken. Both teams take their camp. Portal is being set up, but obviously nobody's really falling for that. And it's party time. Yeah, this is where the rubber meets the road. Now we go. Who's taking it? Level 20 versus level 20. This is potentially the moment. Who gets the kills? Who gets to the Immortal or to the core? Attack on Titan. They have a chance here. They got Jimmy. Solid damage on the Immortal. And they come in and they use it immediately, as you can see. He's really chunking that bad boy down. So, Jimmy with very, very good Immortal damage, and they nearly have it on half time. And the red team has not made a single move yet. What they do, though, is defend at the bot lane. Whereas up here at the top, this is going to march towards the core. So, something to keep in mind here for sure. Half time show is about to be won. They don't have it yet. Light bomb engaged. They go for Medivh. And the shield is there to save him, but Brightwing is dead. Brightwing is down. So is Medivh. C8 with big plays, big damage, big kills. And they're going for the triple. Screw the Immortal. They can end the game right here. With that push at the top, there is no need to go for the Immortal anymore. They can go straight for the top lane and end the game. Absolutely no need to delay this any further. The, this guy gets fired attacking the middle. I mean, honestly, that is just refusing to do your job. That's an F right there if I've ever seen one. Nine kills to five, and that is a win for C8. The series is going to be tied. No way to defend with what they have. The core is falling, and it's falling quickly. They're trying to take the catapults out. They're trying to take the heroes out, but there is no salvaging this anymore. 1-1 one, one as CA takes the victory on Battlefield of Eternity against Attack on Titan. GG. Game number three, we have a series in our hands. Yeah, a 1-1 one, one score, nobody taking the big lead here. C8 winning on Battlefield of Eternity and paying attack on Titan back. 
both these teams want to reach the grand final, the best of seven series that comes up next. And well, now we're heading into Infernal Shrines to see which team takes the lead. Now, on Curse Solo, nobody gave a shit about Vala. Nobody cared. Now that we're heading into Infernal Shrines, though, things have changed a little bit. All of a sudden, Vala becomes a high priority ban again. And yeah, let's see what they can do with this. By the way, one thing also to point out, again, I've talked about it a little bit, but in case that you were not aware, we have still an ongoing deal with Holzcan uh, for the channel, and there's a link in the description. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can check it out right there. We're still getting a 15% discount for any products that you buy on the Holzcan website, and they have awesome stuff. So guys, I said it before, I have a couple of watches myself. I actually bought sunglasses for them too, and usually I'm a little bit on the fence of buying any kind of sunglasses online but love mine they arrived uh, last week i believe and so if you are still looking for something for yourself or maybe you're already starting to buy christmas presents you should definitely check it out so if you haven't done it yet check out the whole scan shop even if you're not really looking to buy anything just now just clicking the link supports the stream but i can heavily recommend it had multiple people that got themselves a watch some accessories for a girlfriend or just sunglasses now lately too and they were super happy with all of this so you can find the link in the description and also the discount code is mentioned there as well i mean 15 percent is nothing really to sneeze on so honestly the biggest discount code that i ever had for any product in any partnership on uh, the channel so still pretty happy about that so yeah have a look there and the meta madness vote link is also there we are going to start meta madness 8 soon and if you haven't voted yet for which hero you do not want to see in the tournament you can do that as well links are all found in the description so have a look there fight time for reset reset loves bright ring he really does the entire time he goes for one bright ring pick after another and it's actually kind of funny because in this series now, we're always getting like Anduin, Brightwing, Brightwing, Anduin, Anduin, Brightwing. But at least Genji has been banned out, so there's no Light Bomb engaged to be had in game number three. Mephisto also has a very, very early pick here. I mean, super early pick. And Malthael on top of that, so a lot of control and positioning here that they have with that. Always assuming at this point that they're going into Tormented Souls again. I mean, maybe we're going to see a switch over into Last Rites, depending on uh, the lineups, but that's what we've seen so far in the tournament. <laughs> and they don't they don't love Sergeant Hammer anymore either. It's actually kind of funny to me, because in the earlier rounds, nobody uh, went for it. It's, by the way, another thing. So teams or people are oftentimes looking at these first round matches, and they're saying, like, oh my god, like, the, 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 the two zeros everywhere. And it's like, well, yeah, that's how a bracket works. That's how seeding works. You have the better teams going up against the weaker teams. That's the whole idea of having a seeded bracket. So if you are really superior to your opponent, it also allows you to change your ban pattern and your pick pattern a little bit to uh, let the opponents that you face afterwards guess. Now, that's obviously associated with the risk. If you overdo it, then all of a sudden you're getting taken out by your opponent. And you should never really underestimate someone that made it into the top eight anyways. But there's always a little interplay in the first rounds of any tournament that you have to also account for at least to an extent so Marin gets now taken together with chromie clear that they are trying to use the entomb storm bolts and whatnot to set chromie up for damage but the final two picks for game number three attack of titan of chaos very interested to now turn things around change the momentum in the in the series again diablo for dami and that is already a bit terrifying already like that and we get Tychus. So they now have Odin for Shrine Fights. They got Mephisto. They have a ton of damage. I mean, damn. Mephisto, Malthael, and Tychus, plus Diablo, who can also do a lot with Lightning Breath and also the Wall Stuns. So not too bad. Very aggressive composition that they're playing here. Very aggressive team composition indeed. And on Infernal Shrines, the final pick for C8. Well, they need more damage, and they go Sylvanas! Sylvanas in the house, Infernal Shrines is the map, everybody. Let's go! Game number three. 
The series is tied, and on the left we have a much more aggressive lineup now for Team Attack on Titan. Tychus, Marthel, and Mephisto for damage, so even the side laner is going to chip in heavily. Dami is playing Diablo again, and then Anduin for all the support that he can provide. Whereas over on the right side of the map, C8, after their recent victory on Battlefield of Eternity, is now playing on another Diablo-themed map with Sylvanas and Chromi for the main damage output. Put Murden and Leoric up at the front line. And Reset is playing Brightwing again. He really, really likes the Fruit Fly. So, level 1, as usual, consumed Vitality. Most likely, we're going to see him with the extended range and his level 4 talent that has been the build that thus far has been played dominantly in this tournament by the Korean players. And in addition to that, we now also might have the Banji Queen in, the Hyper Shift is ready, and a bit of a fight there in the middle. And since we have Diablo on screen, and we also have a Diablo-themed map, I gotta ask, have you guys actually seen the trailer for the second season of Diablo 4? <laughs> I mean, Blizzard really kind of embarrassed themselves heavily in my eyes when they released Diablo 4 in the first place, because essentially what they tried to present to everybody as a finished game was nothing else but a beta. And it was just so bad. I ranted about it multiple times and talked about how they clearly don't play their own games because it was just such so bad. Now they are starting to bring some of the features in that should have been there at release and uh, try to finish the game, so to say, after making everybody pay full price already. But they put out a trailer for the second season of Diablo 4, and that trailer just proves again how shit Blizzard actually is. There's a couple of YouTubers that have showcased the trailer and made fun of it, and it is so unbelievably ridiculous. The quality control in this company has sunk so far, it is unbelievable. I mean, everything that they put on screen on that trailer is pretty much wrong. Like, everything they put in there is wrong. So if you haven't seen the trailer yet, you should definitely uh, search for it on YouTube and see some of the videos that just talk about it. There's also a couple of links in my Discord channel, so if you don't know yet, we have a Discord channel. The link is also in the video description. You can have a look there. We have a Diablo 4 channel there too, and the trailer was linked there as well, or at least the video that talks about it. And it's just, it's a mix between funny and sad. It's so funny to see the trailer being so bad and them just, just screwing everything up from simple math to also showcase or uh, things that they wanted to showcase and video examples that they used for it. And at the same time, it's so unbelievably sad that a company whose motto was, it's done when it's done, we're not even going to give you an ETA, we're not even going to give you a release date or anything, we will finish the product and then we're going to talk about it, that that company has now sunk thus far. So, yeah. It's a little bit of a bittersweet story, but if you haven't seen it yet, I can heavily recommend it. At least it's going to give you a bit of a laugh. So, now that we are looking at the first objective, there's nothing really happened yet. We haven't even seen a big real fight happening. Not a single kill. Everybody just going through the early game motions. Noteworthy that Unti Attack on Titan was able to take two of the bottom three camps. And now with the shrine down at the bottom of the map, we have Tychus trying to defend a bit earlier. It's a really good position for them to take this camp out. So this could actually work in their favor if they can extend that fight a little bit more. So uh, let's see what's going on with that. Right now, yeah, the attacks are coming and they are pushing the red team back very early. So C8 has to fall back and tap the fountain. Whereas the blue team is now in full possession of the position on the shrine and therefore is gonna get that elite. Chromie is still annoying them, but you can already tell that they're giving up on this one. It's actually kind of wild to see the team that doesn't have Tychus. Usually it's the Tychus team that also thinks about like, yeah, should we just wait for level 10 to be a thing? But they're falling back. They might try and get some value with Sylvanas pushing through the top. Uh, now that Tychus is rotating over, he should be able to stop that. And down at the bottom of the map, this is going to be uh, an immortal. Now they got the early level 7. So normally when you're talking about Infernal Shrines, getting access to an early level 7 talent also helps you to go for the objective, but not so in this case. Chromie got bullied around here a bit, but no real threats since she was able to waddle past the wall again and through the gate. Nice bait also over it, so that one went well. But they nearly lost Murden in the process. Yeah, and there is instantly Mephisto trying to finish the job, which they weren't able to do. But with Silvana still at the top, there's some counter pressure to be had. Tigers is rotating between lanes, but the rest of the team now with the Punisher has started to damage the fort. And they got it down to roughly half percent of its HP. That's not too bad. For a first objective, that's actually pretty alright. 
So nicely done by them. And good move also here from Anduin, making sure that nobody falls after Chromie uses the first temporal loop in this game. Has already access to a level 10 talent, obviously, here in level 8. It's kind of funny that Sylvanas is still rotating here. So yeah, Sylvanas doing her thing at the top, just shutting this down. But at least early on, I'd say, nice move from Attack on Titan. No kills yet, we're five minutes in, not a single hero has been killed. I mean, essentially what we're looking at right now is just a bit of a lead in regards to camp control, in uh, regards to damage on structures, but from an experience perspective, a slight advantage that currently goes to uh, the red team. C8 is a little bit farther ahead here, mainly a minion experience that we're able to gain, but that bot lane pressure that we now still see coming up here is, as you can tell, already doing a fair amount of work, but nothing insane. Nothing insane has happened here yet, so we're not looking at any massive advantages. There's no big team fights that have broken out where teams fully committed to anything. So those will happen in a bit, particularly around the second objective, and that should set the pace for the game. But right now, the teams, they're going through the motions, and I guess the Attack on Titan has taken a small advantage over the opponent's team, but it's nothing too insane. Still everybody hoping to maybe get an easy kill in somewhere able to isolate someone. I mean, even the Entomb is now coming out as they're trying to catch, first of all, Malthael, but Tychus falls first. Malthael gets destroyed afterwards, and that all of a sudden means that they're not only losing two heroes, but they're also getting attacked on two lanes. So C8 is again in the driver's seat, turned it around. After the first objective was given up by them, they now have broken through the top wall and are starting to make their play here. Good moves by them. Coming in again, trying to take out another hero, and Malthael got caught with his pants down. So, no chance for him. That's a fort that is likely gonna fall. Even if they can save it, it will be insanely low. And of course, in the middle of the map, they've destroyed the wall too. So yes, the fort is gone. It's a level lead that we're now talking about, 4C8. After the loss in game number one, they have stepped it up big time. Really big time. Those kills were well coordinated and the reaction immediately after getting the advantage numbers helped them a lot to control the top lane and also destroyed the fountain over here. So with the objective spawning topside, that means right from the get-go that C8 has an advantage there. Yeah, things are looking good for the red team. That alone, I mean, this flipped the momentum in the game quite a bit. There was only a small advantage for the blue team to begin with, but this definitely shifted it. And now we have, instead of the Tormented Soul, this time we have the last rites. We also have Consumed Souls. And Anduin is going for the bubble again. More holy word plays from him. Anduin, the man, he's all the words, and Salvation is one of the best ones, apparently. Needs to, of course, keep himself way back out of these fights here. No light bomb engaged this time, which could have been used with multiple heroes on the end. Uh, talking about... Okay, Dami, careful. Brightwing also a bit low, but Reset is able to get out. I'm personally a little bit surprised that they didn't... Co I, honestly, I thought last rides might have been enough to get the hits in. I'm not quite sure about the cooldown situation on Brightwing, if they had to play around something there. Arcane Punisher has during all of this been taken easily by Leoric, so that means that they're already ahead on that. Yeah, here come the plays. Where is the last rides when you need it? Right there! They could use it now, and there's a kill, there's a double, they take two heroes out, but they lose Malthael as well. The bubble out, two kills to four, 13 to 13, but still the pressure at the top lane, and with the Arcane Punisher and the Arcane Sentries, they really need to head back quickly. This wall likely not gonna make it. But nice moves in the fight. So, right there at the start, first they get the first kill, then last right comes out against KCB. That drops Muradin, Brightwing and Muradin both fall. They get at least a couple of kills. The defense is now on, but they lead an experience still firmly in the hands of C8. And they're using it at the bot lane to get themselves another camp. And Diablo was apparently trying to maybe stop this even, and is all of a sudden a full on at the front and will fall, losing the souls that he had. Only the keeping uh, the 25 souls of the Blizzard executives that cancelled HGC and created garbage like Diablo 4. Those he keeps. And I can absolutely agree with that decision on Diablo's side because these people are just evil. So, uh, yeah, he's going to keep those. But with that, 
We now have five kills to two. More of a lead in the experience, and C8 is looking at more camps that they're claiming, trying to extend that lead further by getting more mercenary experience in here as well. So, yeah, let's see. In the middle, still a bit of camp pressure is going to be executed here. Level 16 should honestly be their soon TM for them, just in time for the shrine. That's what we're likely going to get. So... Let's see if they can run that talent advantage, because if they get another objective here, the spawns in the middle this time, it will very likely spell the end of the mid lane fort. But the attack is coming, so in the middle, they were, or down here, they were trying to force another one. Obviously, attack on Titan is now in catch-up mode. They are a bit more than half a level behind. Still a gap that you can bridge, always assuming that you're not losing any additional fights. Another pull happening here to play around Chromie. And, well, Anduin interrupted instantly as he goes for the bubble. Oh, that's a big one. Another stack on last rides for Malta Ale as Tychus and him get the kill against Brightwing. And also the consumed souls were involved there. Really nice moves all of a sudden from the blue team to try and bring themselves back into the game. Not only do they close the experience gap and catch up to level 16, but they now have also a shot at getting another objective maybe. Particularly if they can get another kill here. Even fights from here on out are pretty much guaranteed. Glyph of Faith is now in. So the double pull for Anduin. So he has that. And yeah. Brightwing is going to be back in a moment. And the teams are now starting to go for their camps. Trying to make a move here. Trying to get the Shaman camp. Over on the right side. Tychus. He is already playing this one out again, just Diablo anchoring the play, making sure that nobody can move over to try and steal this away from them. Bit of a watchdog at this point. And here's the next shrine announced in the middle. And they're actually rotating with three towards the top to try and take the Shaman out before the fight even starts. So good for them. Sylvanas is the one attempting to do the same thing now for the red team. But that is decent timing. Sylvanas is going to take a little bit longer than that, depending. Yeah, burns this out quickly, but position is now about to be taken. And they're even getting Leoric a bit low. So good start. And early in Tomb. Very early in Tomb. That's not going to do anything for them. And that's a kill. That's a kill on Brightwing. Brightwing gets caught and killed. Last rides wasn't even needed. He yoloed it out anyways. And that is a third stack now for Malthale. So with him being diligently stacking means also that the cooldown reduction is increasing on his ult and will eventually result to him handing these out like candy. So, yeah. Defense at the top is also happening. Leo doesn't have the Entomb back yet. But it's another objective for Attack on Titan. Guys, I like it. Back and forth. This series has been awesome. Two games so far. Both of them have been great. And now in the third one, it looks like we're going to get a similar treatment. I'm not complaining. Yeah, it's looking great for them. But the kill. Anduin with the bubble goes again for the word. But they cannot prevent the kill. They can take down Leo though. Brightwing too late. Brightwing is too late. Five kills to six. And now still the chance to move through the middle and take another fort down. Since the wall is already destroyed, there is no doubt that they're going to be able to accomplish exactly that. So yeah, there it is. Five kills to six. Nicely done. Marsail is still doing his thing. Mephisto, of course, still dead. But he could still also use his consumed souls there. The fort destroyed within seconds. I mean, that one never had a fighting chance. They're trying to get the wall, and there's no reason why they shouldn't be able to get the entire thing. They're actually rotating back down now and back out of the fight, as Malsa Ale has started to take more camps. So they want the leading experience as well, which they still don't hold. So they still don't have it. Passive experience is now in their favor. Claiming the camps at the bottom of the map should help too. And the red team is trying to intercept... Ah, look at that. Goes for the safe path. I like it. I really like it. Are they still catching him? They're trying. And he jumps away immediately. Rest of the team is here. What an aggressive play from the red team. C8 really looking for that kill. Weren't able to get it. 
Nice and Tomb from Leoric. I love this. Only designed to stop them from chasing. Even that might not be enough though. But I love the idea behind not only the attack that they set up to get a kill against uh, Mephisto, but also the way that it was stopped there by Leoric. Leoric just blocking the path and just saying like, nope, you're not coming through this. I'm gonna stop you right there. This could have been really bad for CA. It could have been fantastic if they get Mephisto, but since they didn't, it could have been incredibly bad if they lost a few heroes on their way back out. But they are still in a bit of an awkward spot. Leo is at the bot lane now. Up at the top, we have the attack continuing onto the fort. And yeah, uh, this should be level 20 for them now. Maybe they can even take the structure out. That would be the dream because the next objective spawns at the top side and Attack on Titan doesn't have a fort there anymore. Meaning they don't have a fountain either. They don't have sustain left on that lane. Anoin is actually going for the Light of Stormwind. Alright! Full in vulnerability. Okay. Let's see how much value they get out of it. And look at that! We get the Burning Despair for the Auric. Another attempt at a last rights kill. This time it doesn't work though. They didn't get the kill. Chromie is still low and has to use the timeout to survive here. And they lose Mephisto. How is the red team still alive? They're chasing again. Malthel is about to be deaded as well. He's dropped. And the quest completed for Leoric in the fight. With Endo now falling too. They're getting three kills in total. Malthel, of course, is already back. And at least Diablo is saying, not on my watch, baby. Dami comes in and drops the fruit fly. He himself makes another play for Sylvanas and forces her back. It's insane how low, how low Muradin is. But yeah, what a battle once again, back and forth the entire time here. Just one fight after another. I gotta love this series. 81,000 damage for Chromie, 48,000 for Tigers, the two top damage dealer for the teams. And another 13 seconds until the shrine is active and Mephisto will be back. Anduin shortly after. Never really went for the bubble here. So. Interesting. Yeah, this could get this could get real wild now on that fight. And of course, they still have the fountain. The fountain is still ready for them. So, here we go. They're going for the fight. There comes the entomb. Anduin is back, has to move in. Brightwing can portal once she's back. She's not back yet. They try another kill on Leo and they get him. But Malthael has also been destroyed. Malthel down, Diablo down, he had the soul stacks, but Malthel cannot buy back. So a big team fight victory again for C8. C8 has the lead now. C8 is looking better here. And they're looking for another kill, and they find it. Anduin, he came, he saw, and he died again. Veni, Vidi, BG. No chance for Blondie. Blondie is gone. Only Leoric fell on the side of C8. They got control now. Control over the shrine. Bot lane is gonna suffer a little bit six, 17 minutes in because of the catapult. Shouldn't really do too much here in the long run, but that was still very strong from C8. So yes, they are fighting tooth and nail here to make sure that they are the ones taking the lead in this best of five series. Looking very, very strong there. Bottom of the map, I guess Brightwing is gonna start defending now. Technically, if they had vision, they could attempt to move in. And Brightwing is actually busy in the mid lane first because there's a catapult too. So both of the keeps are now taking some damage. I don't think that they can destroy either. But it's still a little bit of extra damage on those keeps. The one in the middle more so than the one at the bottom of the map. But it's really just a question of what's happening now at the top. Because despite the fact that there's double camp now pushing in with the catapult, this top lane push could end the game. If it doesn't though, this could destroy the keep in the middle. So there's a certain chance that we will see a trade. Depends a bit on what they can do here. Can they get a kill? Diablo's in real trouble. He doesn't have his soul stacks either. Anduin with a bubble and cancelled right away. So yeah, Anduin is not getting a whole lot of value out of that ult. I think they could have done more again with the light bomb. And as you can tell, the top keep is gone immediately. Meantime, this keep is also going to fall. This keep at the bottom of the map will also fall. If they don't end here, they are going to be in trouble and they can't end. They cannot end. Pull into the middle and the Punisher is gone. And now, as you can tell, they are retreating. Oh, don't tell me this is going to be saved. This would be something. 
down here. Catapult is still doing work, so both of these are low. No, this keep is gonna fall. And they're trying to retreat and they're being chased. Attack on Titan by chasing is preventing them from hearthing back. They cannot really hearth back without being caught by the chase. So now, we have a keep destroyed in the middle, and a keep destroyed at the bottom. Essentially, C8 just lost. They just lost. Not the game, but the situation. Completely backfired to them. They only, they only were able to take a single one, only a single keep down and lost two. Marthel now gone, returning immediately. He's back to business. And at the same time, Diablo, yeah, I guess he's dead too. Diablo is dead, but guess what? This core is now going to lose hit points. And Brightwing isn't enough. Guys, what are you doing? What are you doing with Brightwing? Somebody has to head back. You cannot just let the fruit fly there. Are you kidding me? 45% on the core. Brightwing nearly lost them the game there, or at least that decision. They're chasing Muradin again. Boy, oh boy. Muradin, rewind, and he jumps out. Whoa, this is another one of these games. If honestly, if the mercenary camps would just zone in on the core and not start attacking minions when they spawn, they would have lost way more than that. 45% on the core, and Diablo is back in 20 seconds. I mean, right now, you gotta make sure you don't lose another hero. The worst thing that could happen to Attack on Titan is them staggering deaths. So, they try for Muradin, he hops out, Anduin, the bubble play again, he gets caught, they want him, and they're likely gonna get him, aren't they? Anduin gets caught by Chromie, and that spells the end, just as Diablo is back. That's how you lose a game. That's how you lose a game, right here, take notes, boys. You take a fight you don't need to take, you lose two heroes, and all of a sudden, what looks like a possible victory for you ends up in disaster. If they cannot somehow get a kill here, maybe with Odin, then I think this is going to spell out the end of the game. Anduin dying, and this is just rough. Just as it seems like they might bring this back. Like they might win this game and take the lead in this series. Just as all of this happens, they are all of a sudden in deep shit. So, yeah, there it is. Diablo dies. Now they only have two defenders left, two damage dealers. They are going for Tychus. And he gets pulled back in, of course. But they get a double kill! What? So now it is only one defender with Mephisto. He's buying a little more time. He's dead too. Anduin! Anduin, this is your day to shine. Come on, Anduin. Be useful. Do something. Anduin can be useful now. There he is, trying to uh, use his sword finally, but the core is losing hit points and he's losing them a little bit too quickly. The funny thing that over here the core is also falling. It's down to 30%, but they still end it faster, aren't they? Seven, and there it is. The race is taken by C8 as they take the lead in the best of five. Towers of Doom, game number four. Okay, so the lead goes to C8 and Attack on Titan, even though they had it close. I mean, some of the decisions there towards the end, I really didn't like. I honestly did not like whatsoever. That they, the way that they lost towards the end when they were trying to get the camp, just wait for Diablo. Just wait for Diablo and this thing. Yeah. But now that we're heading into game number four, it is time to talk about protein bars. Got you there, right? So, yeah. Uh, I actually talked on the Twitch chat about this, and I want to throw this out real quickly because it surprised me this week. By the way, not sponsored, okay? Like, no sponsoring, no affiliation, nothing. I get nothing out of this. But uh, this week, I discovered that Lidl has insane protein bars. They have 50% protein, and they're way better than pretty much anything that you can buy on Amazon. So, previously, when, uh, like, either for cycling or for sports in general, when I'm traveling, I usually get myself some of those. And if you are looking for some good ones, make sure that you check out the ones at Lidl. I couldn't believe it that a supermarket like that has good protein bars that they make themselves. I really thought when I saw the label that there has to be some catch on it. So I bought one, brought it home, checked the nutrition labels out and everything, compared it to stuff that I bought previously, did a little bit of research online and all reviews that I could find were just raving about them. Low in sugar, low in fat. 
a huge amount of protein, double than some of the stuff that you can get on Amazon. So if you're actually looking for something, think about that. Would have never occurred to me in my life to search for a decent protein bar at Lidl. So I think a lot of people are probably going to miss out on that. So yeah, no affiliation, not sponsored, not anything. But since the topic came up on the live stream, I thought I'd throw it out there for people that listen to this and might be interested. If not, ignore it. Brightwing and Sylvanas as our opening draft pick. Did I mention that Reset really likes Brightwing? Did I already point that out? Since he plays pretty much nothing else. Unless, of course, the hero is picked or banned. So, yeah. But again, we got uh, Lucio as our first pick for Towers of Doom. So, some quick rotations are definitely possible here. And every day, honor, honor, and Hanzo, let's go. And we got Blaze together with that too. Yeah, Blaze for the top lane. Could have seen the Haka. Would be surprised if we don't see the Haka. Given the way that the two teams have played so far, I think the only two choices for C8 at this moment is either the Haka or Leoric. Not saying there are no other side laners that you could pick. There's obviously Urel still, you could play Malta Ale, all of those are options. But having a global, having the Haka here would be pretty sweet. And it's even something I could see getting banned here. So yeah. Let's see what they're going to do with that. Well, bans are kicking in, but so far we haven't seen a choice from them yet. What's it going to be, boys? They're getting rid of Genji. All right. Okay, so Genji has been eliminated. And with that, we are hopefully getting our side laner choice. And I'm a bit curious. I mean, it depends a little bit also on what kind of main tank you take. If they, for example, say, hey, we're going into uh, Anubarak here, they could go for Anubarak and Ural again as they did previously. That's still a combo that works well here, depending on your play style. But it's Murad and Malthael. Okay. Martha Ale for top lane. Sad moment for the Haka. Apparently nobody likes him anymore. At least here. Poor the Haka. Great value, but nothing that they want to have anything to do with. Okay, so. Now that we're having our double pick, the final one for... This is match point, by the way. So, I mean, I mean duh. So, they really have to bring it now. They go for ETC again with Dami. He had good games with it. And we have false stats. So they have a global. The Haga wasn't chosen on the other side. They have a global now. Brightwing. Brightwing. I mean, Brightwing counts and doesn't count. You know what I mean, right? You can soak a lane, but you can't really push it out properly with Brightwing. At least not when you compare it to either the Haga or false stats. So there's obviously very, very different heroes with a lot more push potential on any lane. But the final pick for the red team and their first match point is Tracer. The cavalry is here. Match point number one, everybody. Towers of Doom. Which team makes it to the grand final? Is C8 going to pull through here now? Or are we going to a fifth map? Is Attack on Titan able to win on Towers of Doom and force the final map of the series? Let's find out. Attack on Titan. They need to win two in a row now if they want to make it to the grand final. But starting with the victory on Towers of Doom would already be good to at least force map number five. On the left, we have them start now with Hans on Falstead for the damage. ETC actually has a potential global as well. They did that before where they went stage dive with him. And even with Lucio, they add a lot of mobility to the team lineup, of course. C8, on the other hand, with a 2-1 lead in this best of five, can now decide the whole thing in their favor and move on to the grand final if they take victory here. We have Sylvanas and Tracer for damage and Malthael on top of that. So already a very, very dangerous draft that they're running with reset on Brightwing once again and in addition it is Muradin that we're getting up at the front. So... Let's get the show on the road. Stacks for Falstad as well. So we get him with the hammering here. We have already the Dwarf block in. Might of the Banji Queen up at the top. It is Blaze who goes up against Malthael. No surprises there. And down to the bottom of the map. It's just a rotational play that we're seeing between the two teams now. Nothing really too insane. ETC of course could still lead to an early kill. If he gets a good power slide for example. That would really do well. But anyways, uh, at the one minute mark, the pumpkin camps are going to appear. 
and then we'll see which team is able to well if both teams just take one or if one of the teams is able to invade you know and steal one away so that's basically the question is anybody aggressive enough in their playstyle for this uh, fourth map that they are willing to commit to a fight there well they're committing to a kill and they get it they might even get a second one tracer is low but is able to escape murder on the other hand he was taken down the dwarf eliminated yeah attack on titan they just hate him Falset is sitting there is like, I'm the only dwarf. I'm uh, Air Muradin, and there can be no one that challenges me. So yeah, he wants all the dwarf gold, and therefore, take him down right away. Bot lane though, they can maybe try and invade here. One kill does not get you so far ahead that you now have a significant uh, advantage or anything. But then again, with quick rotations, thanks to our boy Lucio, they might be able to get some damage in. Zip down, take them on, get the pumpkins connected, break the wall down, and maybe eventually also play around the opponent's pumpkin camp. So yeah, they're getting value. Silvana's not stopping anything since she's up at the top, and now that they have full vision on her, I know that she has absolutely no chance of rotating there in time. They go for the second pumpkin camp and claim it as well. So, off to a good start. Attack on Titan, at least initially, making the plays here. So, good for them. Can they maintain it though? This has always been a map that is decided either by a team completely snowballing the game, of course, or in the late game, when you're starting to gain momentum, you can capitalize on. Uh, just getting full control. Late game control is everything. Once that you are able to capitalize on big death timers and then take multiple bell towers away from your opponent, you're gonna be finding yourself in a very good spot to uh, make up any kind of disadvantage that you have in core points. And they get the ETC kill here. So that was nicely done. Sylvanas coming through for the team and getting that kill. Also allowing them now to have a bit of a lead for the first objective. And they have a chance to get two out of the three altars, particularly now that they took Falstead down. Yeah, that's kind of nice. This is really nicely done. With that, they have now guaranteed that they're getting eight shots fired against the opponent. 32 points against 36. So this was really well played. The coordinated attack of Sylvanas and Tracer in particular left the birdie no chance. Falstead went back into the KFC basket and just got crushed there. Some crispy Falstead McNuggets that we got. Yeah. Level 7 is now in already early. That gives us a locked and loaded. And Tracer can still zip around and currently does so in the middle of the map. As is defending down at the bot lane here. So, there we go. Same time now, in the middle of course, they are dominating that play against Blaze. It has little that he can do. I mean, again, it's two versus one. There's nothing that you can uh, really do about that. But down at the bottom of the map, now the Tracer is coming in. They are hoping to get another kill. Immediately the Squishies are being attacked and there's plenty to choose from. You have Hanzo, you have Falstad, you have Lucio, who in this case is down to 50% HP. So another one uh, that uh, gets eliminated. And over on the left side, we get another pumpkin camp that gets attacked. So, we're gonna grab the third one. Yeah, they have full control over these now. The amazing thing to me is that they're not farther ahead in experience, all things considered. So, yeah, they got a lot of these camps, they did some structural damage. I mean, we can take a look at it. You can see that the minion experience is currently their downfall. Blaze has not been doing nearly as well as Malthale, obviously also considering that Malthale got some additional help. And the hero experience, thanks to that later kill, that also helped quite a lot. Having an early kill doesn't give you as much. It's always dependent a bit on uh, hero levels and uh, they didn't get a whole lot for dropping Muradin early on. So the altar is up and that's the moment where you can now try and uh, get another four shots fired. The attack is already on. They're coming for Hanzo and they are taking him, aren't they? Does he get a heal? Yeah, <laughs> they can heal him in time. <laughs> but they lose Blaze. So now Blaze is gone and reset with another channel. The four shots are fired down to 28 points on the core now. And this is getting dangerous for Attack on Titan. They need to win this. If they lose here, they take third place in the tournament. Then they're out. Level 10, very close. So in kills and experience and points on the core and all elements, C8 is ahead now. And they're finally starting to take a few of their pumpkin camps too. 
<laughs> kind of struggled with that a bit earlier. So now we get the Tormented Souls for our boy Malthael. And, well, no level 10 abilities just yet for Attack on Titan, but they're going to get them in time for the next objective, obviously. It's only a few seconds. There it is. Any surprises? ETC is honestly the only one that I'm really watching here. It could be another stage dive, considering that they already played it earlier. And they could go for some global plays here. There's a couple of interrupts on the other side. You have your Storm Ball, you have your Wailing Arrow, and of course Brightwing too. So the question is always how much can you really get out of Mosh Pit. Get those ETC dance moves onto the map. And he goes stage dive. Yep, we get it again. Stage dive for ETC. So now has a chance there. In the European scene, you normally you go Echo Paddle when you go for Stage Dive. Here it's the uh, Pinball Wizard. Bit of a different situation, obviously, but generally as a rule of thumb, whenever you see a European ETC player go for Echo Paddle as his level 7 talent, it's a very good indicator that he will pick Stage Dive so that he has some extra wave clear on those side lanes and gets more value for the team. Here we've talked about build differences between European and Korean meta quite a bit since the tournament started. Also about a lot of the priorities in picks and bans. Vala stands out in particular, but there's others, of course, as well. And that also accounts for Malthael. A lot more Malthael plays, and also a lot more Tormented Souls that you would ever see in any European tournament. So the amount of picks that he sees here is something that is not happening in the Western scene. You get the occasional Malthael, but not nearly with the priority that we have in uh, this particular tournament now. So ETC is now up at the top, and is starting to jump in. Goes for the first interrupt here, and with that, they are fighting for the altar, but a bit late. I'm saying interrupt, and I'm saying channel, but yeah, they got it already. So the shots were fired. 24, and double kill! One on each side. ETC is down, so in... Uh, well, th th they got chicken earlier, and now they got some beef. At this point, honestly, you can open the butcher shop. I'm actually getting a little bit hungry there, too. I could do with a burger right now. Yeah, for sure. Then again, I'm actually going to be in the US in a week for uh, a couple of days. Have to be careful that I don't get too many burgers there. Maybe the US can redeem themselves. Because so far, I gotta say, the burgers that I'm getting here in Valencia have been better. But I'll try again. Maybe I'll find a decent place. But I assume one of the arguments has always been that uh, if you're talking about the West Coast, that the burgers are much better once that you're going a little bit more towards the middle of the country and that. So at least that's an argument that I've heard quite a few times. And I am indeed again on the West Coast, so yeah. Eventually, I'll make my way farther east and try some of the burgers there too. Next altar phase, double altar. Level 13 talents are in. And at least up to now, C8 is looking good. They're not insanely ahead. So, it's, I mean, honestly, the situation here is that they are mostly ahead when it comes to core points, not in experience or structures or anything. But the way that the game has been flowing has been quite advantageous to him. I think they are coordinating their attacks well. They have Sylvanas and Tracer usually being on the same page whenever they're going on to a single target, which helps them a lot. And yeah, there they showcase it again, and they just get shut down by Falstad, who had to sacrifice the Gust. Even exchange, of course, in this case, in uh, shots. But this puts the uh, blue team now down to 20 points on their core. Yeah. Attack on Titan needs a little bit of a breakthrough play. They need to win a team fight or just out-rotate the opponent a bit, which is definitely possible. They use Falstead though, despite the arrow fired by Hanzo, so Falstead is down. And that immediately triggers another attack by C8 as they're going for additional camps. So this is the one thing that worries me a little bit. It just feels like they are way more reacting than they should, considering that they have Lucio for quick rotations and they also have a global with ETC. So now they just lost the birdie. And it, uh, yeah, Falstead obviously another global that they are running, right? So now they have that going, and yeah, I don't know, Lucy is the only one that hasn't died yet. Experience lead gets slowly extended, it's nothing insane yet, but C8 has a chance of locking in level 16 talents when the objective is up, and I'm not quite sure if Attack on Titan is going to be quick enough for that. I guess they will be? Yeah, they should have enough time on this. Up at the top! Brightwing is in, and uh, ETC gets some assist from Falstead, and they're stealing it with the Gust. Alright, so Gust gets used again. 
Also, the orders are announced. They should have level 16 by the time. Should they? Actually, it's gonna be close. It's gonna be really close. There's not a lot of minion waves on the map now that they can take. So, there's a level 16 talent. Boy, if that window allows CA to walk away with a free 2 altar play, that would be annoying. And it seems like that's what we're going to see. If they're now going into the middle... I'm actually a little bit weirded out by the fact that CA does not immediately on this. Force them into the fight. Why are you giving them more time to get another minion wave in 16? I really don't understand. I don't think that was necessary. They can still win that fight, obviously. But they could have forced them into this, and they didn't. Uh, Tracer gets hit by ETC in a stage dive. And so does the arrow connect. Nice! Tracer is gone, so comeback time, attack on Titan. Somebody wants game number five, don't they? They get the Tracer kill, do they get Murden? Yep, they do get Murden too. So now they have dropped two heroes, they get the additional altar, and it is time to slowly bring this back. There's more time bought by C8, but they are going to grab this eventually. Malthael, very careful my friend. Can't get hit by or killed by, by Forster now. So yeah, shots get fired again, 24 to 16. So only an 8 point difference. And now they're using it on top of that to also take down or at least try that bell tower. With Muradin only down for another 10 seconds, I don't really think this is going to happen. But even if they just drop the bell tower low, it can be taken up later. And they can make a play around that. Forster is coming in, gusting. Yeah, Sylvanas is out. Jumps back in, jumps out, Muradin is on the way, Marcel is on the way, but I think now they're losing the bell tower for sure. They're not committing? What? Nah, there it is, okay. Okay, that's a meme. That's a meme. Somebody needed to fire there. Everybody was just like, yeah, you take it. No, 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 you do it. Nah, 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 you, you get the last shot in. And then turns out nobody actually did. Unlucky. 30,000 for Sylvanas, 37,000 for Anzo. They can pick it up at any point though. They got multiple globals, so they can do that. But they lose another camp up at the top. Now with a 5 versus 5, it seems that C8 is going to try and fight back. And we're in with another couple of Storm Bolts, but the Unstoppable already uh, kicked in for Blaze. So good for him. And yeah, well in the middle they want to go for the birdie. But he's this time too elusive. The bird jumps out. And they take the bell tower. Just as the objective is about to spawn. Which means that this one should be a free hit. Now that you have pretty much no path left down towards the bottom of the map, this should be a free one that Attack on Titan gets. So that would be five shots fired against C8's core. And the question that remains is, can they fight for the other one? This is the moment where the blue team can completely turn it. Now they can turn it around. Channel is already happening. Damage is coming. Yeah, they're trying for plays. Five shots are fired, dropping them down to 19 points on the core. And C8 is trying to get the three that are left. They have three altars. Yeah, interrupt happened. Okay, Murden is deep. Has not used Avatar yet. Get some heals. Hasn't had to rely on his ult up to this point. The channel is not going to happen, no. Gets interrupted once again. Blue team is eager. They want this. They have also a top lane pushing, which works out well for them. But they want those five shots. They want to take the lead in this game. They know that they have to win here. Lead and experience is there already, but they need a lot more than that if they want to win this one. And they're trying. They're looking for the angle. They're trying to figure out what they can do. And they take control, force the opponent back. The shots are fired. And they're even going for the fight down here at the bottom. As we're now looking at 14 points to 16. Another Gust is in. And C8 is losing some ground. Yeah. They're losing ground here. Towers of Doom and the comeback potential that this map offers. Again, showcasing how powerful this map can be. And how back and forth it usually is. So now we're looking again at a position where Attack on Titan could force the fifth map of the series. It's been an incredible match. All the games were closed multiple times. We had core races. 90 stacks now for Falstad for the birdie. And Falstad talking about him is currently not here. Still in the middle together with Malthael. 
They are trying to defend the bell tower at the bottom of the map. And of course, they're also trying to get to level 20. And yeah, just get that storm tail a little bit sooner than uh, the opponent. Given the fact that we have Sylvanas here, they just weren't able to push with her too much so far. Were they now? Normally you would expect that, especially after a few of the team fights and kills that they gotten, that they are able to take some walls down, convert some bell towers over. But we've seen little of that happening. Not really a whole lot. Well, and here's the double altars now. So single digits at this point are more or less inevitable. At least given the situation here. They're not quite, but close, yeah. Fall side at the top. Still has the global that you can use to come back down. And they are trying to bring this one back. Sylvanas, honestly, if she was here already, I think he could do so much more damage here, but that's not happening. Now ETC is getting a free channel at the bottom of the map again, so that's already 9 points on the core of C8. Yeah, they are really starting to be in trouble here. Both teams have a little 20 abilities now, but at this point you gotta YOLO it out. You gotta really go for it. If you don't make a play now, then you're never gonna make another play in this game. You can't save your good plays for game number 5, because it seems like that's what they're doing here. Gust, Wind Tunnel gets used to save plays. Yeah, he made it out. Pumpkins moved through too. Seven points on the red team score. And still the interrupt coming on. As we have Hanzo YOLOing the arrow towards the altar and stunning them out. Malthe in particular is low. They give this up? Boy, really? Two points on the core? Boys, uh, you're really playing with fire now, aren't you? Two pumpkins? One boss or one altar? Phew. Yeah, you really are risking a lot here. 60,000 for Hanzo. We had 43,000 for Sylvanas. And they're just not able to build up that momentum that I expected from them. Particularly after early on they were able to get a few kills. Instead, it is just Attack on Titan that dominates this. And now... What... Honestly, what is CA gonna do? They gotta defend against the pumpkins at the bottom of the map. They got no other choice. And if Falstead... Falstead has Wind Tunnel! All he has to do is line them up and Wind Tunnel and they can win this right here. That's why they're attempting to stop the pumpkins early. That's why they're committing right now. Falls that comes in, there's the wind tunnel, pumpkins are dead, but what about the fight? Can they win this one? You took the pumpkins out, congratulations, you need more than that, and losing Muradin and Brightwing is not really working in your favor. Committing Sudoku at this point is not the play. They lose four, they kill one, Tracer is also dead, five man team wipe, and this is game. This is game. No chance to bring this back anymore. ETC is already at the boss. Dancing baby! Oh yeah, it's a party. They have an altar coming up too, so no matter what kind of play they make, they will win this game. Malthael cannot defend this. He knows it too. That's game. And that is map number five that will come up next in this series. The final map. They force it. We're going the distance in the series between Attack on Titan and C8. GG. Sky Temple, the final map. Yeah, we're going the distance. Attack on Titan is not done yet. They want to fight their brothers in the grand final. Team Beast Titan is still waiting over there around Capybara. So, this is going to be the final one. Final map on this one. The loser takes third place. The winner is at least second. But has also a chance to claim, of course, total victory in the tournament. One of the things that I actually have to um, now also throw out real quickly is that the best of seven is without a game advantage for either team or for the winner bracket team. So that wasn't quite clear until now, but the Koreans just confirmed that. So the best of seven grand final will be starting without a map advantage for the winner bracket team. But again, we have now our final map in this best of five series. Hogger banned, Vala gets banned. I mean, again, we had Vala one time not banned, but she still hasn't been played in the series. And they are getting rid of Sylvanas now too. Sky Temple as a map? I don't really remember if we had Sky Temple in this tournament played yet. 
I'm a bit curious because I could totally see that some of the teams are going for a different approach to this right now. And I want to see if that maybe happens. What kind of strategies are we going to see here? Do you go full global? The Haga falls there? Is somebody busting out a Samuro? I mean, you never know. I think the latter is highly unlikely. But who knows, right? So, with that, we're going to get our first pick, and it is Lucio. Okay, jamming it out. <laughs> I love that one of the skins of Lucy just makes him look like a frog. That's pretty much all that it is at the end of the day. I would like to try those sunglasses on the other hand. Every time I see those glasses, I'm like, hmm. Yeah. Diablo and Genji. Yeah, Dami on Diablo is already terrifying. His ETC is obviously strong, as we now could observe several times, but his Diablo is really powerful. And now that we have the teams going more and more into this Genji light bomb combo, I want to see if that now triggers an Anduin ban from C8. If after the epic phase, if they're just saying, you know what, after all of this and how it has been played out, we're going to get rid of Anduin and you have to pick someone else. There's our global though. So we get the Haka that leaves Falstad up if you want to do anything. I would love to see Abathur, by the way. Abathur would also be nice. Go Worm. Genji, Light Bomb Engage with an Abathur head. Ooh. Don't think we're going to see that, but... Hey, a man can dream. A man can dream. I gave up the dreams of ever growing an afro, so now I have to replace that dream. And uh, that combo is at least one lofty goal that we still have here. And when ban or no and when ban? That's the question. They're pretty hesitant. It's also interesting that they ban Malthael now. The Haka, Malthael would be a triple front line. I guess it has been played previously by C8. So, could have done that. Saves Diablo 2. And there he is. Anduin gets banned. Okay. Nice. We've come a long way. First round of the tournament and what has been played then with Anduin and what we're seeing now, totally different. I mean, completely different strategies that are being played out. Before, we saw Anduin with Genji and Anduin not even picking Light Bomb. Light Bomb was pretty much a talent that nobody chose at all. Then, uh, even if they had the combo, they didn't use it. Uh, pff, Genji, and I mean, again, total different situation now from the beginning of the tournament to where we are at at this point. So, yeah, I like it. Comes closer to what we see in the Western meta. I mean, I pointed differences out a lot throughout the course of the tournament and in those games, but now we have the final two picks for C8. Murden again. They love that dwarf, and they get Rexa. Rexa on Sky Temple. Okay. Bit more control, I suppose, for those shrines, but yeah, Rexa in the house. All right. And what are we getting as the final pick? Game 5, again, this is the chance to bring it all back together. Attack on Titan initially was the team that led, and they go for Sergeant Hammer. It's Hammer time! Sky Temple, everybody! The final map in the best of five. Which team makes it into the grand final? Let's go! C8 against Attack on Titan. The final map, we're going the distance, and on the left we get Attack on Titan with Sergeant Hammer. And look what they just did. They actually swapped over. So Dami is now playing Sergeant Hammer. And I don't really know what exactly is going on because Diablo is called... I never really read through all of the Hangul names, but he's called Kim Dami. So I don't know if what... If, if, I don't know what's going on with the two of them. But I, are they somehow related? Is that I wanted a Smurf account or whatnot? Or did they just roll swap? I mean, whatever the case. They, this is the first Sergeant Hammer game that we have in the tournament. Just look at the level 1 talent. They go for the Maelstrom rounds here. So on the other side, we got Rexa, but this is actually a pretty big twist here, just generally speaking about what's going on. Not only is it the first Sergeant Hammer play that we're getting, it's also, at least for now, different choices made around Sergeant Hammer compared to what we get on the Western side. So we'll see if the build is completely different. I guess Siege Tactics is still something we're going to see here, but either way, we're going to have a look. 
So, seems like Dami switched roles or they switched accounts. I don't know what's really going on there because, again, the Diablo player is called Kim Dami. So, has the same name to an extent. Maybe they had to shift something there. I'm not 100% certain that I can confirm that there's actually a role swap going on. But either way, I'm already excited to see Sarge and Hammer in this one. Now that we have at the bottom of the map, Rex are taking over. Dehaka, I would really like to see him there later, simply because he can global up and contribute to those temple fights. Ooh, Genji. Yeah, Genji getting caught. Brightwing trying for a save and not being able to uh, pull that one off in time. So Genji is down. That's already first blood for C8. But this entire series has been back and forth over and over again from start to finish in nearly every single map. So I'm not giving too much about that first kill here. It's a bit unfortunate, of course, for the blue team, but nothing really to uh, cry about, considering that we're just at level 2. But the first objective and the impact of Sergeant Hammer after level 7, that's going to be uh, probably the biggest thing to watch out for. Still expecting, of course, that we're going to get Sergeant Hammer, at least with the Hover Siege mode. Siege tactics, usually on 4, is also more or less inevitable. I think the only one that doesn't play that is Nick when he goes into the regenerative biosteel. But yes, also here for the Koreans, we get siege tactics as the next choice. So there's that. But all right. With that now, top lane is getting pressured again. They're already moving in and they have, of course, a lot they can do. Sergeant Hammer already in a halfway decent position. Mirrodin jumps in, tries to go for him. There's another stun also from Rexa with Misha, but they got out quickly. And they did a very good job here too, because Siege Tactics was used to evade the stun. They took half of the wall down, so those pressure plays are nice. With a very beefy front line, a very hit point heavy one, they're doing a great job at this now. And their camp is also still in play. One tower is down, so if you're getting the top temple now, it means that a lot of these shots will land on the fort itself. Now, so far, so good. Now, down to the bottom of the map, Genji is still going around, going full Silver Surfer. A little bit of shark surfing, and Sergeant Hammer gets caught up at the top and gets destroyed. Two kills now for C8. Losing a lot of structures here, but getting some hero kills in. Which also results in a lead in experience. So, yeah, it's a bit of a back and forth. Thanks to them losing Sergeant Hammer in this last encounter, it also means, of course, that they cannot take that top temple. And it's one of the reasons why they went for Rexa in the first place. So Rexa and Muradin are both really good at taking temples solo. So that's something that will be very much to their favor if they can buy them a bit of time and space. So Rexa is now directly starting to attack the top forward as everybody else is trying to shield the blue team in the middle so that they can exchange a couple of shots. And yep, this is still looking good. Genji is attacking a bit, level 7 talents are now kicking in, but they've already done a lot here. And Brightwing is fighting it out with the Haka at the bottom of the map, while all of this plays out. There's the Hover Siege mode, I mean, the, that one's absolutely mandatory. Honestly, if Blizzard at any point uh, pays attention to Heroes of the Storm again and follows the same pattern that they've done uh, when they still cared a little bit about the game and pretended to throw patches out, then one of the things that's eventually going to happen is that this is going to be a standard talent, something that you unlock automatically at level 7, similar to what we've seen with the hook range extension on level 13 for Stitches, for example. So, yeah. Because there is no other talent here. That just doesn't exist. I can't even remember. I have no idea what other talents he ha uh, Sergeant Emma has. I think it's a barricade talent, and I think one's with the mines, right? But I honestly don't really know. And in competitive Years of the Storm, I have never seen anything else but this. It's just like, it, it's mandatory. If you want to win the game, if you're not just trolling, then you have to go have a siege mode. So, yeah. It's, it, it's just what it is. At least in competitive play. Good vibrations and off the wall is now in. And, yeah. With that, we're now going to get the next camp. Brightwing, on the other hand, gets caught, and that is three kills to zero now. As the top lane four has suffered a lot of damage, they're still pushing at the bottom of the map, and they're doing their thing right there. Taking the wall down, easy peasy for them with Siege Shines. Yeah, and Sergeant Hammer, of course, now once that she can start to Siege up, it's going to be much more advantageous for them in long drawn out fights. The problem that they are encountering is that level 10 is now very close for CA, just as the Temple activates, so this is all looking really good for them. 
and it's gonna get tricky to do anything about it, particularly if they now lose Genji again. Now he gets out, good for them. Doesn't change the fact that there is a bit of an advantage and it's being used to take the boss before the objective is up. Nobody even sniffs this out in time, so they don't even know. So I guess they're expecting rotation or did they actually catch this and just say like, okay, we're not even poking and trying to delay you so that we can start to fight with level 10 because technically that would have been possible. You could have tried to delay this just a little bit and then get your own level 10 and go for it. But instead, Sergeant Hammer gets attacked and gets dropped. We're having some hiccups on the, on the Asian server, by the way, right now. So, yeah, these are not lags if you're just currently watching this. We have actually some server issues, as it seems. At least on my end. Now, I'm obviously connected cross-server. The players aren't. But, yeah. So, with the boss, they go straight for the fort. They have also now taken out Sergeant Hammer, meaning they're going to take the temple too. The Haka is at the top. I gotta say, C8 is in full control of this game. Full control right now. I mean, that fort is gone. The one at the top is also gonna fall. So that's already a 2 for one special. I mean, what is this? Walmart? Middle of the map. They're able to uh, get some shots connected here too. And this is not looking good whatsoever for Attack on Titan. At least this early in the game, they are struggling a lot. Four kills to one. And with the situation as is... Blue team is now so far behind that from here on out, they have to try and claw their way back into this one. Because the problem is that now that you're so far behind in structures, if you're just exchanging temples with your opponent, you lose the game eventually. Eventually the game's over. And there's another play being made, this time for Genji, including the ult from the Haka connecting. Thankfully for them, Brightwing was able to save the day for the damage dealer. But now the rest gets attacked and uh, you guessed it, this camp is going to be stolen away too. Bunker is out, camp is claimed, they're trying to go for Diablo here as well. Haven't really been able to take him on just yet, but he's about to fall, so Dibbles is gone. Diablo down, and that is bad news for Attack on Titan. They're losing all over the place here. Right now, C8 is going through the blue team like hot butter through cheese. They steal camps away, they take heroes down, and they dominate all of the moves here. Sergeant Hammer trying to get a hit in against Muradin, even that fails. We have level 13 talent now as an advantage for C8 on top of everything else. This is looking better and better for the red team. They're not not quite where they win the game, but that's a level lead talent advantage. All the outer structures destroyed, including the fort in the middle of the map. Unless they are screwing up at some point here, this is going to be tough. Blue team, they need a team fight victory. They need to force the team fight once they have even talents, either on 13 or on 16 talents. And then just like try to win it that way. And it's going to be very tricky. If C8 is playing the smart, for example, they could also just decide that right now they're only taking one temple. They're playing around the opponent a bit. They're rotating. There's a lot of different ways how they could now try to uh, get farther ahead in this game. Particularly with the camp that they set up at the top. They can get the Haka in there as well. Push out towards a few more of these structures. Temples are activating in two and they're already looking to control the bottom one. With the Haka slowly walking towards the middle. Gets actually attacked by Genji now as well. But should easily be able to make his way out of this. But the shots are now fired and we are talking keeps. At this point, we're talking keeps. Brightwing is still at the top, has to deal with that. Will now soon move in, but as soon as Brightwing has to assist at the bottom of the map, it also means that at the top, the towers are going to take a bit more damage. Is that going to attack the keep directly? Probably not, but every bit of damage matters. So, yeah. He's in trouble now too. Same time, here's the play up at the top, and the Haka is still firing shots in the middle. Red team had to move away down at the bottom of the map, of course. And, yeah. It's, it's dicey. It, it's really tricky right now. Five kills to two. Red team. You can clearly tell that the red team is now not giving them fights that easily anymore. Once that they push too hard, they're here to defend. But the red team is all of a sudden a little bit more passive. Just waiting for opportunities instead of trying to force them and create them. And that allows them to now come in with a lick on Sergeant Hammer. The hammer has been dropped. 
And they might get another kill too. At least the Haka gets killed as a counterplay, but they're also losing Blaze. So not only did the keep in the middle already take 50% of damage, but now they're just like jumping around here. Genji at least catches Lucio, so they're getting some kills, but it's still an unfavorable trade for them. Level 16 is there. Brightwing is likely going to fall now. So, yep, Trashwing is gone, and that is another play for maybe even the middle. There's not a lot to take on the map now, but the boss is up in six seconds, so technically they could even try to do that. I doubt it though, considering that Brightwing will be back soonish. They don't have to risk anything there either, but they're pulling further ahead in experience, and level 20 is another one, and Diablo in the middle. I mean, yeah. If anything wasn't needed, then it was this play there. Now they have a free boss. Now that Diablo died again and is this time down for the count, they can go for the boss and take this one once more. Tempus are going to be up in the middle in the top lane. Genji sees it, but what is he going to do? YOLO in and all of a sudden kill everybody? This isn't lol. So, yeah, 10 kills to 4, and things are dire. Dire for uh, Attack on Titan. Up in the top lane, the Haka, he's been defending. Now, he's obviously lost a bit of ground here. Was up against multiple opponents. Boss is now at the bottom of the map starting to make his way through. We're only 12 minutes in. So this will do some damage, but they're also going to steal another camp away. And once that they've done that, what they can do afterwards is go for those temples. So no matter what attack on Titan does now, they're going to lose some additional ground. Some more structures are going to fall. Boss defense is happening in time, but then they still need to rotate. And as expected, some damage is done. Tower down, gate pretty much destroyed. The Haka is now up at the top. He's taking some shots there. Rest of the team is in the middle. And they still also got to deal with the play here up at the top as the camp is coming in. Even another Siege Giant camp at the bottom of the map because they know they just have to macro it up now if they want to win this one. And top side, the keep is already getting attacked from the shots alone. So yeah, all over the place, they're now under pressure. So they got to be a bit careful. They're trying to catch the Harker. And he is... That was a bit of an early burrow. Yeah, he's dead. I mean, he's dead. <laughs> he died for a good cause. I gave him that. He died for a good cause. And they're getting the keep. So the, do <clears throat> the top keep is already gone. One eliminated. And at least the fort up here got destroyed too. So all of the forts on the red team side are also eliminated. So, but again, it's not the same amount of damage that we're seeing here. We're having Siege Shine still at the bottom of the map that could technically do some structural damage towards the keep. Over here, this one is already low. They're still fighting over the remaining shots and Brightwing isn't here. And one of the reasons why the red team is just so generous with their time and not really forcing any fights is because they know that they're going to be the first one to level 20. And once that's the case, they can win these temples a lot more easily. So yeah, damage comes out once again as they're going for Diablo and burn him down. Taika is saying thank you very much for a great target. Gets to 52,000 damage. Not quite the same numbers that Sergeant Hammers brings, but still. And down here, yeah, it's another keep that is now going to take damage. As already expected. So yeah, this keep, all, they're getting it. This keep, it seems like they're going to take the entire thing. The fight in the middle still breaks out. Lucio goes out and gets killed by Genji. Blue team, they need to really beast this now. Get the fight on. Yes, there we go. Kill number one. Kill number two. Try and go for number three. Really come in and attempt to take them on here. That's what they have to do now. And then force the issue. Try what you can... See what you can get. Push some structures out. Siege up with Sergeant Hammer. It's the only choice that they have. Down at the bottom of the map, yes... Another keep is about to be destroyed here. Brightwing is trying to do something about it. It's already too late. Keep is gone. That means that there's only a little bit of the hit points left in the middle keep. So one temple that gets taken by C8 is going to do core damage already. Level 20 not there yet for C8. But attack on Titan. They think they have a chance here. They're slowly bringing this back. Tigers is down for another 20 seconds. And they're just sieging up. They're saying, this is our best chance. Siege up, do damage. Use Sergeant Hammer as best as we can. Catapults on 
on the core, get attacked by the minions. Minions should be able to defend this. And the blue team desperately trying after they've been losing ground pretty much all game to finally use Sergeant Hammer to a fullest extent and get this game locked in. Oh, nearly a kill on the Arca. They go again for Murden. And it is Blaze that falls. Blaze is gone. Level 20 is finally in for C8. And now they coil Diablo 2. Diablo is dead as well. They're chasing further. They want more. Dehaka came in towards the back end. And now they're going for Brightwing. This is game. Altar up in 18. All they gotta do is channel the altar. Boss is gonna be up in another 50 seconds. There's still Siege Shine camps that they could go for too. Here in the middle. I'm actually, if anything, shocked that they didn't already take the keep down. But with Blaze missing, the only way, the only chance for Attack on Titan is to now start attacking. Bye bye, keep. The final one is gone, and now the core is gonna be attacked directly. Genji is already attempting to poke. They're setting another camp up over here before they're joining the fight with full force. But yeah, this this is tough. Without Blaze, he's now back, but he still has travel time until he arrives here. Maybe they got a chance, but not if Diablo gets killed again. He Hellgates out. Genji, X-Strike, Genji. And he Swift strikes away, still alive. But they are catching another one. Brightwing also with no ability. And it's Meriden that falls. How? <laughs> Attack on Titan all of a sudden. Do they still have a chance here? They have nothing left essentially. But they saved three heroes in that fight. And then they killed Meriden. And now the Hakas that they're going to win the game. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? No way. That's impossible. What? Up at the top, there's another push for Core, but they got Sergeant Hammer and there's only two defenders left. How did they just do that? What just happened here? This cannot be real. <laughs> Three heroes were pretty much dead and somehow escaped and then they turned it, got multiple hits in and now they're starting to take the core down. Yes, there's catapults on the other side too, but it's not nearly as fast. It's another race. Genji is dead. This is insane. Attack on Titan turns the game and wins the series. Insane comeback. GG, what a series.